I'm calling to report a missing person. Okay, who is this regarding? My daughter. Hey, welcome to Behind the Curtain. Before we begin, I wanted to let you guys know that I've launched the Behind the Curtain Discord server. So if you want a place where you can talk about filmmaking and screenwriting, you should join. The link will be in the description, and I look forward to talking with you. Let's begin. We knew Searching would be a mystery movie. And like part of that was like even motivated by like the initial prompt was make, you know, the idea was like, what, what kind of short story can you guys tell us on a computer screen? Like Anisha always says this beautifully, like a mystery movie is about revealing information. Sometimes it's false information, sometimes it's correct information. Um, sometimes information is incredibly hard to get bit by bit. And what do we use your computers for if not to get information? Like what are your friends up to? What kind of jobs can you find? What's in the news? So we realized like, and this is getting like really nerdy with the writing of it all, like every movie needs something to keep people in their seats. If it's an action movie, you better have some really fun set pieces. If it's a comedy movie, you gotta make people laugh. If it's a horror movie, you gotta get people scared and so forth. If we're telling like a thriller mystery, then we gotta have some really good revelations, some good reveals, i.e. twists. And we kind of just like, you know, our process is we just start with a blank sheet of paper and we just start sketching like act one, act two, two A, two B, midpoint. And then kind of think about like, you know, with the missing person story, it's kind of really simple. You know, the break to two should be the father beginning to hunt to go find his daughter, like entering the woods. So therefore the inciting incident is she goes missing. So the rest of act one should be him like slowly coming to the realization that she's missing. And like, you know, Save the Cat calls it the debate section. In our story, it's about a father who's kind of oblivious, fooling himself into thinking everything's okay, because that's kind of been his MO for the past couple of years. So then you got 2A, which is the promise and the premise. This is where in any other scene, the father's going door to door, knocking, going to like her school, grabbing students. We can't do that, but with Facebook, you can still find them. And like, you know, using all of that stuff, like we were able to very already, we just knew what all these like, you know, posts were gonna be, we just have to start stringing all the lights to them. It's really, really simple to find the goalposts for a movie, a, a missing person thriller. It's so obvious what those big points are. Um, the challenge then becomes, how is our version the most unique version of this movie? Or how is how is ours the first time you're seeing it this way? And that's what, what kind of like what Seth was talking about and that adaptation of like, okay, we knew what the movie is in a standard live action film. He's knocking door to door. Now in this one, he's calling FaceTime. What is that for every moment of the movie? You know, like what is that for someone goes missing? Like normally, you know, you'd show the scene itself. Like Margot gets into a car with somebody, drives off, and that's the last thing we see. You know, like how do we do that in this version? Okay, missed calls, like at night, and you see him sleeping through the missed calls. And then the next morning, he's, you know, like it's just an adaptation process, but it starts first in finding out what is the story, not what is how we're gonna tell the story, which has sort of like been the, was the challenge the entire time is just making sure that it was a story for telling, the, telling informing the way as opposed to the other way around. If somebody was like tapping mine and Anisha's phones and listening to all of our conversations, one of the most common phrases that they would hear is, okay, this is a really, really, really bad idea, but what if? Because for us, like we have this trust now that we've been working with so many years, there's zero ego. And all the time, we know we need a beat to occur to like connect A scene A with scene C, what is gonna be scene B. We just start with the worst, first thing that comes to your mind. Okay, really bad idea. What if, you know, his brother is a pothead? I don't know. And then like, okay, well, that's not such a bad idea. What about blah, what about that? I mean, it's probably fair to say like at least 50% of the time, the bad idea is what ends up in the movie, but maybe it wasn't such a bad idea. Sometimes the, the thing, like the most obvious, simple beat of the idea is the best thing. And you just gotta wrap it up and hide it, put the crap in a box and then put a bow on the box. And then all of a sudden it looks like a present, you know? And like, I think like that's a lot of, sometimes our writing is like the simplest idea, the most bare bones idea, it works if you can present it in a way that no one's seen before. Yeah, and then even to your other example, like, as far as like with Searching being a movie that's set on computer screens, but it's very much traditional story by design. Like we knew for instance, like close to the midpoint, we would want a scene where the main character has all but given up on the search because he's convinced his daughter is not missing. She just ran away. And we knew we wanted a scene where like, he's basically about to give up and then struck with this like eureka moment. And then the case blows up. And like the example that we would often think about is like any traditional detective movie or noir or whodunit in which like let's say somebody's investigating the crime scene one last time there's flashlights everywhere you know like they have the light on they're like searching underneath the mattresses there's nothing there's literally no sign of anything bro like the case is closed 
And as the detective is leaving, they go to like turn off the light switch. And as their finger touches the switch, they notice for the first time a tiny smudge of blood that they never saw before. And that leads them to that, leads them to that. And then they uncover a huge break in the case. And we knew we were gonna have that close to the midpoint. We didn't know quite how it was gonna be, but eventually like what Anisha's saying, as we iterated and iterated and iterated and kept in mind the promise of this movie's premise, we landed on what if he's shutting down his computer? And you have like that 30 second window on Mac computers before you like, you can shut down automatically. And what if his finger is hovering on that shutdown, but just to the right frame of that, you would see something that, you know, he hadn't realized was as important. And that then opens up and blows up and blows up and blows up. So oftentimes it would be, we often talk in referencing other movies or tropes or things like that. And like, and he said, we just build upon it as we, as we come back around to it later in the process. I, I think the midpoint is the most important beat in a story. The, the midpoint to me can prove a concept, can prove whether or not your story is good enough to be a feature film. Because like a good midpoint, basically, in my opinion, um, all my favorite films, and I don't, again, I think anyone can break rules, but they gotta break rules knowing what the rules are, I, is, my, is my general philosophy on these things. Um, but like any movie that's trying to follow structure, the midpoint always should be some sort of successful execution of the log line or of the break to two, only for, for there to be a but then right after it. You know, so like the searching log line is uh, a desperate father searches for his missing daughter, like by hunting for clues on our laptop computer, you know? And then midpoint, he discovers where she went. Like he, he, he accomplishes that, he, he like, he's looking for her, he finds out where she went. It's at, the, it's at the lake, you know? And only for then, the after the lake, you realize actually she's abducted. And it gives you a whole different push of a story. Like if you look at a great story, the first half and the second half are different pieces. You know, in Star Wars, they have to get to Alderaan. They get to Alderaan, but then it explodes and then they get captured. You know, like I think great movies or the movies that we aspire to that if you can nail that midpoint, if you can find out how the log line, accomplishing that log line at the midpoint gives the story another engine, you've got a good movie. You know, like that, that's, the, that's why the mid, like a lot of people can write a great break to two, a great act one, a great inciting incident, you know, but like if it cannot be supported by the thing that's gonna happen 25 minutes from now, then like it's not gonna be a full net narrative feature in my opinion. You know, what's so funny is that this is, this is our notebook for our next movie, right? And like, so like, I'm not gonna show you anything of like of craziness, but like you'll see early on, literally in the notebook, that drawing, this little, this little thing. You'll see it there again. You'll see it there again. You'll see it every single time we're drawing a note, like an idea, it's that drawing. It's that little skeleton. That's like status quo, inciting incident, break to two, midpoint, break to three, climax. And then it's started inside of those lines, debate, fun and games, bad guys close in. We always have that. We know what the structures of the story are before we decide to like invest more time in the scenes. Our process was kind of built from like when I was an indie producer, um, searching was my first time being like a quote unquote lead producer. So for a lot of times I was like a junior slash co-producer on these movies. And I found, you know, we would have like, we would shoot the movie, we would edit the movie, and then we would screen the movie for friends to like give us notes on the post-production of it all. And I did find myself so many times hearing like people giving comments about the movie's story and why they felt it wasn't working and what they wish was happening. And you know, the director, the producers, the editor would often be like, oh yeah, that's a good point. We'll see what we can do with the footage. And I just was like, why aren't people doing this before they shoot? You know, like we can actually make a whole different story if we know what's not working. So, and even when I was coming up in the industry, like people would send me their scripts for my feedback and I would read a script, I would write a couple of notes and I would often get on a phone call share my thoughts with the writer and they would say, cool, thank you so much. And I found myself thinking like, man, I just read your script. I have it fresh in my mind. I'm a virgin reader. I have no idea what the story was gonna be. Wouldn't they wanna just interrogate me? Like, don't they have questions? So for us, like we have a very like aggressive feedback system. We send the script to our friends. Then we schedule a one hour phone call with them and we hear all their thoughts right off the bat. But then we go through our questions with them and we've kind of have literally like an hour's worth of questions and um it's divided into three sections there's general questions macro questions and micro questions and the general questions are very general like what did you like about it um what scenes did you not like 
Um, did it feel long? Like what scenes felt boring? And like, you know, things like that. They could just apply to any script. And we even have them rate things. Would you rate the character worth one through five? Rate the ending one through five. The macro questions are fascinating because they're like, you know, searching, you just read the script, David Kim, like, did you like like him? Or like, what, what, what would you say was his thing to overcome as a character? And like, we're investigating that. Oh, like the entire, like the presence of police, how did that read to you? And we just kind of, we're writing all these answers down. Then we go to the micro questions, which is probably a little bit obsessive of us. And that is basically us asking people questions about page 12, like page four. This, this joke on page four, did you find it funny? Oh, you didn't realize it was a joke? Awesome, thank you, good to know. Um, and, and basically like we literally go through this thing and a lot of times like these questions are genuinely just natural questions that Anish and I have against each other. Like we may write a joke and I might say, dude, I don't think this is funny. He'll say, bro, you're crazy, it's hilarious. And we'll say, okay, cool, throw it on the list. And then when we ask people, okay, seven of the eight people found this joke funny, great, let's keep it. Or like, oh shoot, four said it was funny, four said it wasn't, we probably need something better and so forth. So we kind of are very systematic. To us, it just, it, it gives us that knowledge and that when we go shoot this movie and screen it, we're less likely to have these issues because we've already kind of addressed them. Because, you know, our goal is we want to make great movies, intelligent movies for audiences. You know, like there is a line of thought of like, I'm going to make my art and not care about the audience, but like, we want to make like crowd pleasing, um, you know, widespread entertainment and then what better way to do it than just know right off the bat. Thank you